Good evening, everyone. We are so honored to have Mrs. Ken travel from Washington, D.C. today to be with us and give us a keynote speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Holly Ken. Thank you for the kind introduction, Michael. Good evening. It's very special and wonderful to be here with you all today. And to be with you, Michael, the Carolinas Chinese Chamber of Commerce members, and very distinguished guests. And it's actually very great to be here in Charlotte. This is a very special city. It's a major commerce hub and the second largest banking center in the country. Charlotte is the third fastest growing major city in the US, and Charlotte ranks as the top city for millennials. And Charlotte is the birthplace and resting place of America's pastor, Billy Graham. He evangelized millions around the world and countless more through radio and television. Reverend Graham once said, faith is central to American life and liberty, and he is still right today. Amen. Something else central to American life is freedom. Our freedom comes in many forms, and for businesses, it may seem oppressive with federal regulations. President Trump is committed to reducing the federal footprint in all aspects of our lives. For one, the president recognized <laughs> For one, the president recognized the burden placed on businesses and, and individuals by heavy taxation that needed to be lightened. And since President Trump signed the Tax Cut and Jobs Act into law, economic optimism has hit a 13-year high, fueled by hundreds of companies that have announced bonuses and wage increases and general stock market gains. And small business confidence is surging in 2018. According to the National Small Business Administration, 59% of small businesses said that they anticipate economic expansion in the next year. And the Trump administration is creating those avenues for businesses of all sizes to expand, to enter new markets, and compete like you never have before. Dollars that have stayed abroad are coming into this country, making investments right here so that goods and services are produced in America. Wasteful and costly regulations are being eliminated to reduce regulatory burden and harm the American worker and economy. And we are going to build and invest in America's infrastructure. Today, one out of five miles of US highway pavement is in poor condition. Almost 40% of America's bridges are more than 50 years old. Our president is a builder and a visionary. And the proposal that he has put forward will stimulate at least $1.5 trillion in infrastructure investment, which includes a, million, a minimum of $200 billion in direct federal funding. The rebuilding will include not only roads and bridges, but drinking and wastewater, energy, broadband and internet access, and veterans hospitals. Today, a maze of red tape and oversight continues to hold back infrastructure projects, despite the fact that most infrastructure spending is not federal, it's state and local. And this plan will eliminate barriers that would have pre prevented virtually all infrastructures from being efficiently developed and managed. And this proposal will invest in America's most important asset, our people. The President's plan will reform federal education and workforce development programs to help prepare Americans to perform the, to perform the in-demand in -demand jobs of today and the future. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos has challenged the country to rethink our approach to education. 
That means we question everything to ensure that nothing limits a student from pursuing his or her passion and achieving his or her potential. That is true for K through 12, as well as higher education. We must rethink what higher education actually looks like and resist the urge to promote one pathway above alternatives. There should be many options because there are many types of students and there are many types of needs in our economy. As we focus on economic growth and education excellence, what does this mean for our global trading partners? Making America great again does not mean America alone. As President Trump so accurately stated, when the United States grow, grows, so does the world. And that is true for our global relationships and partnerships. Our trade policy with any other nation or region will be fair, free, and have reciprocity. I had the honor of meeting Chinese Ambassador Chui at the Kennedy Center Lunar New Year celebration in DC in February. And at remarks that Ambassador Chui made at the Meridian International Center in celebrating Chinese New Year, he stated that in the past year, China and US relations, and I quote, made important progress in this relationship. Going forward for the months and years ahead, let's work together to keep this important relationship on the right track on the basis of mutual respect and better mutual understanding, unquote. And I've met incredible leaders across the country in the last four months since I've taken charge of the responsibilities of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Everyone that I meet with is seeking ways to collaborate. So what does this all mean and how did I get here? I'd like to take a moment and share with you my story and my journey and a view into the vision of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I was born in South Vietnam during the American War. My family is Chinese, hailing from Guangzhou. My family fled Vietnam in 1979 after fear of Chinese persecution and a longing for life without oppression. Vietnam was not a place to raise five young children, and my parents knew that they had to flee. Returning to China and possibly reuniting with family was just not an appealing option, but America was a very appealing option. In the summer of 1979, we began a treacherous six-month journey that led our family to America. In January 1980, we settled in Texas as refugees and learn to assimilate as quickly as possible. I was seven years old. So last year, 37 years after immigrating to America, I find myself in public service, serving as a senior leader in the Trump administration. So how did I get there? Hard work, focus, determination, and luck. I'll start with luck, my husband. By way, of making it, by way of making it to this great country, my husband's family did as well. Via a journey, very lengthy journey across oceans, but that was in 1752. From Germany to land in Virginia in 1753. And where they landed is actually not very far from where we reside in DC today. I feel very fortunate to have a wonderful husband and father of our two children. But I also attribute luck to being at the right place at the right time. And the rest of it is all up to me. To work hard, harder than I can imagine. To stay focused and determined to really meet or exceed all of those objectives established. After 22 years spent in corporate America, learning the ropes, failing, getting up and trying again, failing again, and yet never stop trying. I felt that I was at peace with my accomplishments and took early retirement from Hiller Packard Enterprise when that was offered in 2016. I served as an advisor to the Trump campaign and after the election in 2016, I was asked to serve in the new Trump administration. 
but I had my doubts of how I would serve. I don't have a political background. I spent my entire career in private enterprise. And what can I do to give back to this great country? Well, my technical and business background proved useful in running any organization. And I was head of management running operations at the US Department of Education prior to being appointed to my current role with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So the mission of the White House Initiative, as Michael has stated, is to improve the quality of life and opportunities for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And we do that by increasing access and participation with federal programs, especially where the AAPI community is underserved. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are the fastest racial group in the United States. And the population of AAPIs is estimated to double to almost 50 million by 2060. And the model myth minority, the belief that all AAPIs are educated, self-sufficient, affluent, it has prevented a lot of AAPI communities from fully benefiting from these federal programs and resources. But in reality, the AAPI community is not a monolithic group. And each group faces unique challenges from education to health. For example, one in three AAPIs is limited English proficient. Half of those living with hepatitis B are AAPI. And only one in seven Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders has a college degree. So recognizing the tremendous growth and the unique needs within the API communities, the federal government has made great strides to improve the lives of these families and communities. The initiative was established in 1999 by executive order by President Clinton. And to do just that, to drive access, to drive access to federal programs and resources. And the White House Initiative, my office, we do that through connections and we do that through convenings. The executive order also established a commission. It's a President's Advisory Commission on APIs. It's a 20-member board made up of community members, civic leaders, public and private sector leaders that have a vested interest in bettering the API community. We also have an interagency working group representing federal agencies and executive offices. There's 31 of them. And they are charged with creating and implementing strategic plans to help the API community access federal resources. So my objective at the initiative is to connect and to collaborate with local grassroots organizations like the Carolinas Chinese Chamber of Commerce. And many API groups are not aware of our initiative nor how to access those federal resources that are available. Yes, the federal government is shrinking, but it's not going away. It's simply losing some fat. And we need to slim up where there was unnecessary growth that crept into the system. And we need to make smart decisions on how best to utilize our limited resources. So our work at the initiative will align closely with this administration's priorities. Strengthening the economy, developing the workforce and increasing our talent pool, focusing on performance and merit, and enabling each American that seeks opportunities, the right channels and the path to their own success. You have ample opportunities here as an organization that promotes and encourages economic, cultural and educational exchanges between the United States and China. Much of the growth right here in Charlotte is due to foreign immigration, not only from China, but all parts of the world. Embrace what is available and seek to strengthen your community through partnerships and volunteerism. Speaking of, my partner, uh, speaking of partnerships, my office is partnering with the Minority Business Development Agency, part of the part of the US Department of Commerce and the Asian Pacific Islander Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship to create and develop joint AAPI business outreach and programs. We are co-hosting the 2018 AAPI Business Summit in Washington, DC 
on May the 15th. So mark your calendar. This is a nationally attended event, and our theme this year is opening doors to new opportunities. I also want to share that my office is offering internships. So this summer, right here in, D in DC, we're seeking enthusiastic students to work on outreach, communications, engagement, and policy. So please spread the word. Lastly, I want to congratulate the Carolinas Chinese Chamber of Commerce for the successful opening of the Carolinas Chinese American Civic Center. The chamber is giving back to the community by establishing a very key resource for Chinese Americans with services for cultural exchange, which is very important right here in Charlotte. I am very privileged to be with you all this evening to celebrate the sixth anniversary of the Carolinas Chinese Chamber of Commerce. You have very strong leadership with your new chairman, Richard Young, and your new president, Michael Wong, and the outlook for the Carolinas is very bright. Enjoy the performances and the dinner this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.